Okay, everybody, in this chapter, we're going to talk about states. And we're not talking about the United States, obviously. We're talking about, um, you know, governments, right? And then, so if we look at our learning objectives right now, uh, we could see, we're going to talk about kind of uh, the d distinguish between states and nations and explain why the state is a dominant organizing framework for politics in the world today. We're also going to talk about relations between states and nations in a country that can shape politics today. We're talking about global developments that have popped up and have caused challenges to the construction of stable nation states. Uh, we're going to evaluate sovereignty and talk about what sovereignty is and what sovereignty, sh sovereignty should be. And then we're going to also look at some explanations why, you know, Afghanistan can be considered a failed state. So when we talk about states, American states are not in this context. We're talking about an organization that runs a country. And I think when you, you know, kind of look at it from, you know, American politics, you could use the word maybe administration. So I think that's one of the things that goes kind of kind of one of the better analogies that we could put um, on the the to the word state. All right. Um, and they're going to have formal supremacy over the over other organizations within their borders. So within their sovereign land. Max Weber um, said the state is an organization with a monopoly on the legitimate use of force in a fixed territory, meaning that states have territorial monopoly, monopolies. Um, and if there's any type of encroachment or change to borders, that might lead to some type of war or some type of conflict. And the state is the one that can control the violence at its core. You know, the state monopolized legitimate violence, like, you know, maybe law enforcement or the military. Um, it's their responsibility in the U.S. to, uh, with the military, to, you know, kind of set policy and, and, and direction of the military. Um, the Congress is somewhat directly responsible for law enforcement. You know, some money for law enforcement agencies come from the federal government, as well as state and local monies, as we learned in the last semester. So if we summed up as some uh, sovereignty states divide the world's territories between them each is supreme in its territory each has its own uh sovereign area and usually like we said that's delineated by a border with a recognized government um, they govern its own eternal affairs and agrees not to interfere with other states or other administrations or other countries right um, the com concept of a sovereign state has evolved over time and the first states originated in Europe. Um, if we look at alternatives and obstacles to the state model, we have something like an empire. Uh, you all know uh, the Roman Empire. A lot of the empires that were in, in in the past, the Galactic Empire from you know Star Wars, you know they're ruled by a king or an emperor. In Star Wars, it's Emperor Palpatine, right? Clear, lack clear fixed borders and highly systematic rules for their territory and even some instances of very authoritarian government. The empire, and not an empire, the population and distance lands consider separate people from the people of the imperial center and is controlled with a mixture of imperial and local personnel. Um, we also saw a rise of large organized religions. And then religion is, you know, it's a funny thing when we talk about it. Uh, political leaders need support of powerful religious leaders. And we could see this in the United States. We talked about this in last, you know, you probably talked about this last semester where, or you probably talked about this in a, uh, you've taken Political Science 102, about, um, you know, the religious right and their powerful influence on kind of policies that the Republicans have. Um, the Catholic Church, which... You know, they have the Pope and, you know, uh, Joe Biden was one of the first uh, Catholic presidents since JFK. And, you know, there's always kind of been a concern with that because um, the the Vatican also sets up, you know, in, you know, issues that they have stances on and that might influence, uh, you know, citizens, the doctrine that the Catholic Church puts out. You know, we have similar issues where areas that are under Sharia law or Islamic areas as well. And religious leaders really know, have no defined territory, but they can claim authority over all members wherever they are. So 
the Vatican is a good example, again, where the Pope and some of the catechist doctrine that comes out of the uh, Catholic Church might be, you know, can influence somebody in the United States, in Mexico, in the Philippines, every place that, you know, there might be some groups practicing Catholicism. We also had feudalism in medieval Europe, where we had the complex patchwork of territories with hierarchies over lords, vassals, etc. We had the rise of city-states in Europe thanks to expanded trade. And this especially happened in Italy. Um, during the rise of city-states in Europe thanks to expanded trade, wealthy people were, uh, were uh, able to operate independently. And then they built some uh, city-states that banded together. And by the 1500s, all of Europe was a mess of overlapping political structure. When we saw the rise of states, Catholic Church authority was the first obstacle to fall. Uh, a Protestant Reformation, which you all might have learned about in world history, weakened authority. And we also had improvements in military technology, which led to larger, more disciplined forces. You know, things like longbow, longbows, firearms, cannons. Kind of the, the, the evolution of the technology of war weapons and, and ammunition and all that stuff. War made the state, and the state made war. We also had, you know, kind of economic developments allow kings to fund larger armies. Remember, when we kind of talk about defense and, and the, the concept of security among the state, because there's going to be three goals of a state. Security, stability, and prosperity. And I think the first thing you have to have is security before you can get to stability. And then you have to have security and stability until you get to, to so you can get to prosperity. English and British kings uh, made deals with rising merchant class, you know, having economic perfection for taxes to pay for war. So a revenue source, much like, you know, our tax dollars are used to fund military uh, equipment, technology and all that. And the Treaty of Westphalia, another thing that might sound familiar, it ended long periods of religious war in the 1600s, and it established each ruler's authority over secular and religious matters in its own realm, including the right to choose religion. So something that might be familiar to us here in the United States. Sovereignty doesn't establish by raw power alone. You have to have legitimacy. You have to have a legitimate government. Remember, you don't necessarily have to have a dem democratic government for it to be legitimate. Um, but, you know, there are ways that external things might recognize maybe even more important for authority than effective internal control. Nations and states are not the same thing. So what I said earlier is remember when you use the word state in this context, state might refer to the government that's running the country, right? So the administration. So I think that's the best word we can use here. They may have a state before a nation and vice versa. Sometimes nations and states never align, especially when imposed from the outside. And we're going to see instances of this later. When states created nations, we have things like France and Britain. Uh, these states were crea created nations to encourage loyalty, build armies, kind of build a consensus, and create kind of a national symbol or national pride or legends for people to identify with. You know what? You know, here in the United States, we learn about George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, right? Kind of the, the, the people that are symbols of our country now. And, you know, things that they did that we kind of hold in, you know, a very precious place within our culture here in the United States. Uh, the attempt to stamp out other languages and subcultures, and encourage a nationalistic pride in serving the state. Now, remember, nationalism is a word that sometimes is not really used in its proper context. Nationalism is going to be the, kind of my definition of it is, uh, you know, kind of giving up your values, even if you disagree with the, with the, with the government or with the state, and you're willing to compromise those values for the betterment of the country, right? Um, you know, when we hear nationalism, one of the things we think about is fascism and Nazism, right? Well, that's at least what I think of. Uh, nationalism is very different than patriotism. Patriotism is just your love for your country, right? 
and you know supporting them uh you know uh, when the olympics are on uh, tend to root for the united states or maybe with what other country we might have you know maybe blood from or you know what we might have in the city so you know it's one of those things where the words nationalism is kind of used wrong in my opinion at times when nations created states, places like Germany, Italy, Japan, um, people saw themselves as different from the governing state, common language, common cultural identity. People need to define, defend shared culture values when it's one factor that led to fascism. Again, that nationalistic point of view where one language, one culture, one country. And, you know, I mean, one of the beautiful things about the United States is we have this mix of, of different cultures and different uh, creeds, different uh, ethnicities, different uh, sexual uh, preferences, uh, gender, all of that stuff. Um, but, you know, in these more fascist type countries, you're going to see a limitation of that. When states were imposed over nations, remember colonialism spread state models outside of Europe. Right? The uh, uh, you know, North uh, America is a good example. Um, they conquered most of the world in the 18th and 19th century, ignoring language, religion, cultural culture of con uh, conquered areas, and also the conquering of land, the stealing of land, right? There was a vast wave of decolonization under, after World War II where most colonies gained independence but kind of kept colonial borders. New states had to start uh, political organizations from scratch after colonial powers left, and some areas had easier transitions to that nation-state model due to their histories. Places like Japan, China, Thailand, Egypt, Iran. And then we had most of the difficult times with the new nation-state model, um, you know, establishing control internally, establishing a cohesive identity, the Author talks about attempts to form a multinational identity in Nigeria, attempts to align state borders with national identities, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and that led to bloody conflicts. Now, when we talk about decolonization of some areas led to kind of quasi-permanent conflict, Iraq and Afghanistan are a very good example, right? So we have Iraq. They have a variety of, of sects of... Islam in it, you have Shini, Suya, Sun, uh, Sunni, uh, Shiite, um, uh, there's even Chaldeans, which are Ka Iraqi Catholics, and, you know, sometimes those groups will have conflicts with each other. Afghanistan is another one, you know, there's, you know, people in Afghanistan that want freedom, and then you have the Taliban, which really tries to kind of of use that fascist point of view in its attempt to, to control a group of people. Iraq's potential for sovereignty was more promising than Afghanistan. You know, kind of a stronger history of a central government. You know, oil resources, a richer, more educated population. But after the war on terror um, and the search for WMDs in Iraq... Iraq still slid back into the civil war. And, you know, you have some of those ethnicities or the, those sects uh, acting in conflict. Afghanistan is a, you know, it's considered a failed state, honestly, right? They lack national identity, lacks foundations for states. One of the poorest places in the world uh, never have government to sell, that delivered uh, significant services, um, not much natural resources. Uh, their nation building was unsuccessful despite massive American investment in the attempt to move Afghanistan to a more democratic nation, right? And, you know, one of the things that we have to understand about Afghanistan, it's really kind of barren of natural resources. They do have, they do have poppy, right? And poppy is, you know, the, the, the plant that is used to make opium. And that, you know, you can find, you know, drugs just like heroin and, and some of those painkillers that are out there. Um, interesting thing about Afghanistan. So one of the main reasons of the spread of the state model, powerful states would deal only with other states. You know, 
Without a state, you can't have diplomatic relations. Uh, you can't have foreign aid or UN membership or participate in the Olympics. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the things that kind of ties into sovereignty, like we talked about, is that recognition of our borders by other countries as well. And maybe engaging in diplomacy with them. So, you know, lacking that diplomatic relations and, and foreign aid really can inhibit a state from or a government from growing. A little chart that uh, we'll kind of skip over. Um, there are no more empires, city-states, or Hanasitic leagues. Um, some believe we are maybe approaching the end of the state-bound era. and But Europe has also initiated the state model. So we have the concept of unitary states and federal states, right? The central government holds at all political authority in unitary states. This is known as political centralization. In a federal state, lower levels of government have distinct authority as well and are relatively decentralized. So just kind of try to think of some examples of a unitary state versus a federal state. Obviously, the federal states would be something like the United States, Canada, Mexico would be a federal state. But if we look and we have unitary states, we have France, Japan, uh, Germany would be one. J the Japanese have 47 prefunctures that are kind of like provinces or states, uh, but they control a lot of their identity in those countries. Japan has, uh, you know, powers of 47 uh, prefectures that can be changed by central government. A unitary example in England, there's no uh, regional levels of government, although there are for areas of Britain, including Scotland and Wales. Uh, remember, the UK is made up of all the countries, Scotland, Wales, uh, Great Britain, and uh, Northern Ireland. Ireland is its own sovereign nation. And when we get to talking maybe about political violence, we'll go into and talk about the Troubles, which were conflicts between Northern Ireland and Ireland, which got very, very contentious. And we have, you know, Bloody Sunday. And we'll, we'll get into that later. Switzerland is a federal state, tend to occur when the state grouped together multiple identities. One of the most decentralized states in the world. And they have separate regions of speakers of French, German, and Italian. Some federal states are very large and diverse. The U.S. is a perfect example, right? We have many cultures, many religions here, many ethnicities. But then again, we are kind of, in a sense, a little bit subservient to the federal government if we are in a state or even a locality like San Diego. Unitary powers may shift toward federalism to accommodate internal identity conflicts. Uh, Spain is now considered a federal state. Uh, federalism is part of Iraq's 2005 constitution. In contrast, Afghanistan's 2004 constitution called for a unitary state since central government was so weak already. Now, let's talk about the concept of citizenship. And citizenship is different throughout the world. So, uh, you know, citizenship is legal membership in a state, comes with various rights and benefits right so now if we look at citizenship in the united states what does that entitle us to obviously if we're over 18 u.s citizen the right to vote um you know you could be on jury duty if only if you're a u.s citizen um i like to kind of maybe put in things like Maybe lawful permanent residents here in the United States uh, because they're pretty much given the same constitutional privileges that a U.S. citizen will. The only thing is they can't serve on a jury or they can't vote. And there might be some other things that I can't think of off the top of my head. But for the most part, there are kind of benefits to being a, a government. I mean, a citizen to the government. There's going to be a couple of, of things to look at. Uh, states with strong, strong national identities before statehood. Some states have the concept of just sanguineness, 
which means right of blood citizenship. And only descendants of citizens can be citizens. So if you go and look at uh, the CIA World Factbook, it has a list of recognized countries throughout the world. And it will tell you what the citizenship requirements are in that state. So even long, 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 lifelong residents can be non-citizens. Germany only recently about, uh, allowed a path to naturalization. Obviously, the United States has a path toward nat uh, naturalization where if you're in the country for a certain amount of time, you go down to, I guess, um, the State Department or, or uh, Customs and Border Patrol. I'm not quite sure who uh, handles it. Department of Homeland Security, maybe. Um, and you go and take a test and an interview, and you can become a U.S. citizen. And this kind of goes into hand with something of just solis, a right of soil citizenship. And the United States is a an example of right of soil citizenship, which it's often accompanied by relatively open naturalization process for immigrants. So, like we said, here in the United States, you go apply to be a U.S. citizen. You take a test, you have an interview. Um, if everything goes by and you pay your fees, you go and be, you're sworn in as a U.S. citizen. Now, during the Trump administration, one of the things that he wanted to do was uh, change this where, I guess, if, if, you're, if somebody was here illegally and they had a baby, the baby would not be a U.S. citizen. Um, can he do that? Yes and no, right? Yes, is he could try to put the law, maybe sign an executive order, uh, you know, detailing that, but it would be declared unconstitutional because it clearly states that anyone born in the United States is a citizen, right? No matter what. Doesn't talk about status, doesn't talk about resident status. So, something kind of very important to take into account. This allowed states to declare anyone living uh, on their territory citizens. It implies a shared identity and loyalty to states. Remember, we have different cultures, but sometimes we have, you know, the same amount of loyalty to, to a country, right? Um, even if we don't agree politically, from left to right, you know, all kind of, you know, people that may be uh, appreciative of their citizenship, but maybe look at how things are run a different way. And, you know, definitely we're a country that's been made up of immigrants, to be honest with you, right? And... Um, we have contributions from every group as well as our native groups. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just a, a situation where, you know, we tend to forget that. Countries are going to be a mixture of rules. U.S. citizens for those born in the U.S. and those born abroad to American uh, parents. Melting plot image clash with historical discrimination. You know, the slave, slavery discriminations against uh, Irish, Italian, German, Jewish, Polish, Chinese immigrants, and kind of the, 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 the negative view of immigration from Mexico, and not just Mexico now, but also Central America. Now, we also have the concept of a failed state, right? And there's no effective political authority at all in a failed state. And it creates much more instability, both internally and internationally. And like we said, Afghanistan is a perfect example. Had ethnic challenges, ethnic groups not getting along with each other. There's been situations where governments have tried to maybe influence Afghanistan, right? Whether it's Britain Soviet Union in the 70s in the United States in the early 2000s. You know, the Soviet Union tried to encro encroach the Afghan border. Um, the United States went into Afghanistan to look for Osama bin Laden and stayed and tried to uh, eradicate the Taliban. Uh, were successful. Um, democracy was tried and it kind of failed. Now, you know, even today... You see some aspects of the Taliban getting gaining more and more power. Afghanistan is one of the poorest countries in the world, right? Divided by huge mountains and no economic basis to generate taxes. So no way to kind of fund services for people or to fund, you know, infrastructure. 
The United States overthrew the Taliban regime, tried to establish democracy. Fight against Taliban continues even today. Um, even peaceful regions are actually under local warlords' control. And remember, it's just, you know, in the past uh, few years, uh, the United States has pulled out of Afghanistan. And there was a lot of problems with that and a lot of issues that were really unfortunate and sad. Uh, where people that, you know, actually helped the United States during the early 2000s were kind of maybe left, hung out to dry a bit. So, as in Somalia, authorities challenged by patriarchal tribal groups or clans, people identify first with the extended family of the father's bloodline. It's a very patriarchal society. A concept of fulfilled states assumes that every bit of the territory should be part of a coherent state. Our state model may fit poorly with some societies, and pressure for of, for statehood remains. It's a little bit of charts that you guys can look at. So there's some challenges to the new nation state model, right? States are a product of a time where people never traveled out of their own village. Technological issues, economic, social, and political change poses problems to this format today. One of the things that's also kind of, of looked up like in, in, through different views, through different ideologies, is the concept of globalization. You know, globalization is the way that flows increase in goods and services and money and ideas and people from state to state, administration to administration. You know, the, the concept of trade here in the United States, you know, trading with Mexico, trading with uh, the Philippines, trading with European countries, right? And, you know, we have multinational corporations that are, are existent. Um, we have, you know ever uh you know government that provides services to countries that may be in need you know through you know you know we have governmental organizations like the UN and some of the branches that the UN has with you know the human rights council um development and stuff like that but globalization tends to drain power from states so North America and Europe support for internal international investments, etc. These are challenges. Um, push other countries to open markets, allow free movement of people and information, continue to maintain strong authority amid openness, and states with more rigid control are threatened by openness. So maybe those authoritarian are, are maybe some of these relations are not necessarily needed in free market societies. I mean, technically you could, you know, trade maybe with the command economy or a mixed economy. You know, remember we have a mixed economy here in the United States uh, where we have, you know, a free market system with some aspects of governmental control. Human rights is also an issue that we have to really be aware of. Um, these are rights that no state can legitimately ignore. And remember, at the United Nations level, there are instances that they will get the United Nations will get involved if there are um, are human rights violations present. Some of the examples might be freedom of religion or some type of due process. And if we talk about international laws, this is a set of rules that are generally accepted as binding. Right, something like the Geneva Convention, which is uh, an agreement where, you know, it's only it's funny because I think it tends the United States is one of the few people at times that that followed the Geneva Convention, which you know bans chemical and biological weapons and mandates humane treatment of prisoners of war. Then we have these inter international organizations that I talked about earlier. Uh, their most direct external pressure systems on some state behaviors, the United Nations, the World Trade Organizations, and the European Union. 
They can tell member states what to do on some issues. The European Union is by far the most powerful international organization ever created. And what I think, um, you know, there's there's some advantages to the EU and also there's some cri critics that are criticisms of the EU that, you know, maybe have caused places like the UK to leave the European Union. Whether it's the fact that immigration was fairly open um, and there was a concern, especially in the UK, that some of the the culture might be whittled down a bit by the, the influx of people of different cultures. So just kind of to understand that. And sometimes these will have effects on state sovereignties because powerful countries join to make their country stronger, not weaker. So when we talk about kind of the the state sovereignty for multiple ideological views uh the state accepts accept that it's a good thing by many politicians there's a cost benefit debated um if we look at fascism word is highly threatening right and it's a very alarming word so states must be very powerful and uh, uh militarized to keep up with this world that is also highly threatened threatening right so that word is threatening and also the world is threatening so these states must be powerful and militarized because you know in a sense if you look at it too i mean the one thing that you can kind of look at with this is that not only there are the citizens that citizens may be kind of 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 afraid of fascism but also other governments as well if we look at modern conservatives or modern conservatives and they support security and defense spending but may be reluctant to interfere in other states affairs or practice kind of a system of isolationism they believe that intervention will lead to instability and not progress give me kind of opposite of what we hear with neoconservatism where neoconservatism is kind of that george w bush uh, ideology where it is our responsibility as citizens to go out and spread democracy throughout the world and they favor an aggressive intervention in the world to promote liberal democracy if we look at it from a Lockean point of view or a John Locke point of view um, states support individual rights remember here in the United States you know we have natural rights which is uh, the rights of life, liberty, and property, or as uh, Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, hard to imagine how little democracy could have emerged without a state first or someone to kind of control. Uh, modern conservatism defends sovereignty. You know, there's a concern that they may worry that weakened state control will lead to the loss of individual rights as well as the loss of security and stability. And remember, without security and stability, you can't prosper. Modern liberals are more optimistic about progress. Uh, active governments can improve people's lives and they worry about possible costs of sovereignty. Uh, you know, maybe making government bigger like we talked about in ideologies. Active government can improve people's lives by maybe, you know, helping with jobs or with education. Modern liberals think that active pressure and undemocratic, undemocratic regimes can improve the world, you know, have the people treated better and, you know, see process even if it costs some stability. Also kind of creates an us versus them mentality, right? Need to keep out the wrong people or the people that maybe we don't want to, you know, be neighbors with. Um, security problems have gotten more violent with the advent of states, and you know, or administrations. We had two world wars in the 20th century and countless conflicts, right? And there's, uh, you know, I mean, there was only one period, you know, after the Korean War up to the Vietnam War where uh, we weren't really involved in any type of external conflict. And, you know, here in the United States today, we're always generally in, in some type of, of conflict, in, in some type of, of, you know, kind of keeping our eye on some type of issue that might be happening throughout the world. 
Ideologies that aim for progress want to modify or eliminate state sovereignty. Modern liberals, moderate on immigration, favor international cooperation on an issue that cut across governments and cut across states. Now, we talk about ideologies that aim for progress and want to modify or eliminate state sovereignty. You know, it's pure Marxist or, you know, a socialistic point of view. The rich use states to employ, employ workers. Remember, that was a criticism that Marx had of capitalism. And it calls for revolution across borders. So kind of taking a whole system down. Environmentalist sovereignty allows states to ignore global issues such as climate change. Ideologies that aim for progress wants to modify or eliminate state sovereignty. Radical Islamists, you know, practicing Sharia law, Iran, Afghanistan. And this means a return to religious authority in Muslim lands. And states are an artificial Western intervention. Just some charts for you want to see. Now, if we look at, you know... Afghanistan is often perceived as being very close to a failed state. I would classify it as a failed state, right? Important to find explanations. Why? Three stories, but likely a blend. Geography, poverty, security threats, history of foreign intervention, the United States, Britain, Soviet Union. And no one's ever been successful about building an administration. So we look at it, the institutional story, central government starting from scratch. Better prospects if new institutions can get buy-in. The ideational, state powers challenged by tribal identities and radical religious doctrines. And they can succeed if a group that's on the outside can form some type of shared identity. Okay, here's some more charts for you to look at. Go ahead and, you know, look at some of the explanations that are tied to this. And then in the next uh, video, we'll talk about chapter 5, which are nations. Okay, thanks a lot.